Honorable Minister, uh, Manjula De Silva, Chairman of uh, SEMA Sri Lanka, members of the board uh, of SEMA Sri Lanka, distinguished foreign resource persons and guests, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a great pleasure and a privilege to be here with you uh, at these annual sessions. What I'm proposing to do is to try to give you some background uh, against which uh, you may want to consider how we are going to join the dots over the, uh, your technical sessions tomorrow. Um, and I want to start by trying to make the case that this is probably the best, most favorable set of circumstances Sri Lanka has had for about 50 years. Uh, but to say that there are some major paradigm shifts which have already taken place, to which we need to adjust if we are to realize the potential of the present conjuncture. Then to talk about the need for a new growth model, a new development model, and why we, why we need such a model. Uh, and uh, subsequently, uh, Manjula sent me four questions, so I'll finish off by trying to answer those four questions. So why do I say this is the most propitious, most favorable set of circumstances uh, Sri Lanka has had for over 50 years? If you look back to the late 1950s, for 25 years from then, Sri Lanka had a secular and severe decline in its terms of trade. It was basically a, a tea, rubber, and ex a coconut export economy then. And for 25 years, the prices of those key commodities fell. In fact, if you look at the World Bank's World Development Report, which is the World Bank's flagship publication every year, you look at the 1982 version and you see a box on Sri Lanka, citing Sri Lanka as a classical case of a country which had been buffeted by severe terms of trade decline for, for a couple of decades. At the same time when, as this was happening, there was a demographic surge. At that time, the population was growing at over 3% per annum. So the surpluses in the economy were coming down and the population was going up. So these were major drags on the economic prospects of the country and the problems were compounded by the fact that Sri Lanka adopted inward-looking, dirigist, controls-oriented policies in, uh, starting with 1960 and intensified in the uh, 1970s. So you had you know, that again, um, in those days, that was the orthodoxy for many countries. Uh, people felt that they needed to insulate their economies from the vagaries of the uh, international um, the system. Uh, but clearly, at that time, the market was, domestic market was probably 15 million or so, or maybe less. Um, you can't really drive 5, 6, 7, 8% growth with on a domestic market of 15 million. So the policies were wholly inappropriate. So a mixture of the two factors I mentioned earlier, the terms of trade, the demographic pressure, and the problem compounded by uh, misaligned policies meant that the country's prospects were um, severely constrained. Then the economy was liberalized in 1978, but Sri Lanka did not really, was not able to <coughs> Um, take advantage or to get the best possible returns on the liberalization of the economy uh, because of the onset of the conflict, the onset and escalation of the conflict. You look around today and there are no such major drags on the economic prospects of the country. On top of that, Sri Lanka is located in Asia. We are 20 miles from the fastest growing large economy in the world and now with the um, likely passage of the GST, the general sales tax, and the creation of a single market in India, that economy is likely to be even more buoyant. So we are on the doorstep of that. We are right in the middle of China's maritime silk route. And we have excellent bilateral relations with not only the other capital surplus countries in, in Asia, like Japan, Korea, Singapore. Uh, we also have good relations with uh, the US and Europe, which are our key markets. So you take all this together, and this is probably the best shot that we've had for many years. Uh, there are those who say, and the Honorable Minister touched uh, uh, 
on, on this. Um, you know, the, the, the new normal for the world economy uh, is uh, lower growth and sluggish international trade. So people say, well, is this the time to be embarking on an outward-looking export-led strategy? Um, and here, the answer to that, in my view, is that Sri Lanka's location, which I was talking, which I've just talked about, as well as its excellent international relations with the capital surplus countries of Asia, means that these two factors, I think, will trump the disadvantages accruing from the um, rather sluggish, slow-moving global environment. So, through our location and through our uh, through leveraging the relations that we have with capital surplus economies in Asia, we should be able to overcome the advantages, the disadvantages of a uh, rather uh, uh, slow-moving global economy. Okay, so the prospects for the economy, in my view, are excellent uh, for these factors. There's no major drag holding us back, and we are in we are located in the most dynamic region in the world. Okay, but if we are to realize the full potential of this particular moment, we cannot assume that business as usual is going to work. In fact, business as usual is becoming more and more challenging. And I'd like to give three reasons for that. One, we need to have a better balance between social development and inclusive growth. There are people who say, well, look, you know, Sri Lanka has its own way of doing things. Why are we so exercised by trying to accelerate our growth rate? This economy grew at 5% during the conflict. We have excellent social indicators. We were high performers in terms of the UNDP's Human Development Index on the Millennium Development Goals. You know, what is, what is the problem? Why, why are we getting exercised? Let us continue as we have done. Uh, in the past. Now, that's one narrative. The other narrative is Sri Lanka was second to Japan in Asia on almost any indicator at the time of independence. Today, we are behind many countries in Asia. Many countries to the east of us have left us far, far behind. Countries we were ahead of at independence, countries we were ahead of as late as 1965. Sri Lanka had better indicators than South Korea in 1965. Had similar indicators to Singapore in 1965. Singapore's per capita income is 56,000, ours is 4,000 today. So to say that, you know, uh, what we've been doing is good and we should continue, uh, clearly does not make sense. And that's not the only reason. I think the lesson from the Sri Lankan experience is, yes, social development does promote economic resilience. The economy was resilient during the conflict. Um, and, you know, uh, the education of, of our people means that, you know, that there is a baseline below which the economy does not fall. Having said that, that's not enough. Because the other lesson is that social development alone is not enough. Why do I say that? That's because we've had two sudden insurrections and a separatist conflict in the north. In my view, the primary causal factor has been a mismatch between opportunities and expectations of our young people. So, we are a country where, where there are rapid aspiration, rapidly growing aspirations, and if those aspirations are not met, we have a legacy, legacy of things spilling over into violence. So in such a context, the, the pressure is on to make sure that we grow sufficiently fast, grow the cake sufficiently fast, but we also may need to make sure that the minister in his uh, talk to, um, uh, referred to the increasing inequality all around the world. We need to factor in uh, inclusive growth as we go forward. So that's one challenge why we, in terms of business as usual, not being uh, uh, sufficient. The second reason uh, why, we need, why business as usual is becoming more challenging is that Sri Lanka is now a low middle income country. Middle income country. Now, until 2010, Sri Lanka was a low income country and was a donor darling. We got very generous um, uh, flows of highly concessional foreign aid. Uh, 
Uh, we were able to live beyond our means for every year since 1987. Recurrent expenditure was higher than revenue. That means we borrowed for rec our recurrent expenditure every year. It's okay to borrow for capital expenditure as long as you, you know you, you, you screen the investment and you get a decent return. But if you're borrowing for recurrent expenditure, clearly that's not a sustainable outcome. We were able to do so because we got all this generous foreign aid, which kept us afloat. The traditional donors wanted Sri Lanka to succeed because it was the second country after Chile which liberalized this economy. So a country with liberal economic policies and a liberal open poverty was one which the traditional donors wanted to demonstrate could deliver good development outcomes. So there was very generous support. But it really was not in the long run very helpful to us because it meant that we were able to dodge taking the hard decisions in terms of getting ourselves lean and mean to be competitive in a global economy. So really, um, what we've had over the last 60, 70 years since, since independence is a rather toxic combination of populist politics and a deeply entrenched entitlement culture amongst our people. And the two have fed off each other and has taken us downhill in a non-virtuous cycle. So that is something that needs to be broken. The minister, the honorable minister, talked about breaking uh, the mold in terms of the harm mindset. And this is very crucial. We, we can't continue uh, in, 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 you know, globalization places a very high premium on competitiveness. So we have to have a laser-like focus on productivity and competitiveness. That is not something that is in our DNA at the moment. But that has to change if we are to uh, realize the, the, the full potential uh, of this uh, propitious moment that I was talking about. The third challenge which makes business as usual uh, uh, more difficult is the fact that Sri Lanka is almost unique in that it has experienced its demographic transition before its economic transformation. We are beginning to age at a much earlier stage in our development process than almost any country. I don't know of any other country that has actually experienced this. In some ways, we are being penalized for our success because the main reason for this is that we have been very successful in educating the girl child. We have educated our girls. There's been, there's been a very successful voluntary family planning program. What it has meant though is that we've started to age at a rather early stage of our development. And what does that mean? It means that you can no longer drive growth by labor augmentation. You can't add more and more people to the labor force to drive growth. That means, again, it's productivity, competitiveness. We have to be much more focused on total factor productivity, which is about innovation, skills of the labor force, and research, etc. So this is a much more challenging way of having to develop. You can't just add labor, and particularly cheap labor, and grow. It's a much more complex challenge for us. So we need to adjust to that. Um, let me now uh, talk about what, uh, what the contours of a, of a new uh, development uh, model could be. The vision um, that the present government has uh, is to create a competitive social market economy which is environmentally sustainable and equitable. That's, that's the objective. Um, now, one thing, you know, in South Asia, we're very shy about growth. Not just in Sri Lanka. I've been working for the Commonwealth. I've traveled around South Asia. In South Asia, nobody says, you know, growth is a good thing. We always talk about sustainable growth or participatory growth or inclusive growth. You go to East Asia, they unabashedly say, we want to grow with this economy. Our economy has to grow. Primarily because they've demonstrated that it's possible to have high growth which actually lifts people out of poverty. China has pulled 300 million people out of poverty. You look all over Southeast Asia, not only have they grown fast, that they've been able to reduce poverty. So there is this dichotomy between uh, growth and 
um, equality that some people paint is wrong if you have the right kind of policies. You can have both. Okay, so what is the growth framework that we need to work towards um, at this point in our, in our kind of economic uh, uh, evolution? It has to be private sector driven with exports and FDI as key pillars. Let me say why, take each of those in turn. Why private sector? I must say, I've been a public servant all my life, so I have no ideological commitment to private sector development. If you look around the world, good development outcomes have been delivered by various political systems. China and Vietnam have status systems, there are plenty of market economies which have been successful, and you have countries in the middle. So there's a whole different spectrum uh, of, uh, of, of successful development outcomes with different types of systems. But for Sri Lanka, we have no choice. We have maxed out on our credit card. The government has maxed out on its credit card. The, the government does not have money. The minister spent a lot of time talking about this. So we have, you know, there is no option. It has to be private sector driven because the uh, 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 government just, just doesn't have the cash. It can't drive the growth process. The money we are borrowing is largely being used to repay our debts. So there is no, you know, space in terms of the government driving the development process. Yes, you can have some PPPs, but it's, as I said, it's not ideological, it's a no-brainer. The private sector has to step up. So that's why I say it's a private, it's a private, it has to be a private sector driven uh, development process. Why exports? I think all of you know it's a market of 21 million. You can't drive 7-8% growth, which we need to meet the aspirations of our people uh, by selling into a market of 21 million people. Uh, and the minister is in the process of putting together a framework uh, through these uh, trade deals that uh, he and his team are negotiating. By this time next year, Sri Lanka could and should have preferential access to a market of 3 billion people. The, the free trade agreement with India, which currently covers goods, is being deepened and broadened to include services, um, investment, training, uh, um, whatever it is now, uh, technology. Uh, in addition, partnership agreements are being signed with uh, China and Singapore. The existing FTA with Pakistan is being invigorated. And with a bit of luck, it's most likely that the EU will restore the GSP+. Plus. So by this time next year, Sri Lanka will be in the position of having preferential access to a market of 3 billion people. Now, of course, the primary objective of this trade deal is to create access, market access, for Sri Lankan exporters. But in many ways, the biggest prize will be to leverage the trade investment nexus to show this market preferential access to the market of three billion people and attract investment in here. In fact, the Honorable Minister will remember when he was in China in March of this year, on more than one occasion, the Chinese authorities told him, Honorable Minister, you should sign this agreement with India you're negotiating because it will make it easier for us to tell our companies to come and invest in Sri Lanka so that they can sell into India. Similarly, Indian companies can come in here to sell to China. We can maybe take some of the Indo-Pakistan trade that's going through Dubai. We can maybe take a slice of that through uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities that can be thrown up once this framework that the Honorable Minister is trying to put together is, is, is uh, in place. So exports. Why FDI? Clearly we have a savings investment gap. We need non-debt creating flows because we no longer can borrow, uh, at least have incremental borrowing. We don't need to borrow to pay back the debt, but incremental borrowing is a, is a challenge. Uh, and FDI brings in technology, markets, branding, know-how, etc. So that's the third part of the piece. Now, clearly I've said growth is important, uh, but the government's vision is of a, as a social market economy and inclusivity has to be factored into this. 
but inclusivity not through handouts which are unaffordable and subsidies etc but inclusivity by empowering people through education training and skills development to participate in the decent jobs which one hopes will be created in the modernizing sectors of the economy so that's really where it, that's the transmission mechanism through which one spreads the benefits of growth it is to empower people through education training and skills development of course, in any society, there will be those who need support and we need to have a social safety net which is well targeted and well designed and is based on transfer payments rather than subsidies which distort uh, prices in the uh, economy. Equally, environmental sustainability. I think is, we see more and more, uh, uh, we see intense and um, increasingly intense and more frequent uh, severe weather events so there's a no-brainer clearly that environmental consideration for the whole of humanity is important and here again um, environmental factors need to be mainstreamed into the planning and budgetary processes of the government and the businesses need to adopt a triple bottom line accounting um, and the other thing is regional balance. The government, through its development program, is seeking to achieve regional balance. I think all of you know about the Western Region Megapolis Project and the, uh, the Colombo International Financial City, uh, the land reclamation that is being undertaken. Um, there's going to be massive Chinese investment into Hambantota. The whole area is being developed, the port and the airport. Uh, that debt is hopefully going to be taken off the government balance sheet through Chinese investment. Singapore is doing a master plan for the Trincomalee area and they will then try to attract Singaporean companies to come and set up there and they are also keen to work with the Indians and Japanese in that area. The Japanese are doing a master plan for candy. So, and I was in Jaffna yesterday, there is quite a lot of activity going on there. Um, the Indians are rehabilitating Palali Airport and Kangasanthura Airport and some of the other donors are, uh, are building capacity in terms of vocational training institutes uh, and trying to provide financing for the SME sector. So all around the country there are plans afoot. Um, but there is one thing that needs to be fixed really uh, without which nothing is possible. Uh, the minister spent considerable time talking about it and that is essentially sorting out the fiscal situation. Um, to really move forward one needs stable macroeconomic fundamentals. Without that, you in this room who are in the business sector cannot plan and expand uh, with confidence and certainty. Over the years, Sri Lanka has, can be characterized as a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, and overvalued currency economy. That is diametrically the opposite of what a successful country in Asia have done, who had very low budget deficit, low inflation, low nominal interest rate, and an undervalued and stable currency. So, what has happened in Sri Lanka is that consistently this, this toxic combination of populist politics and in the entrenched uh, entitlement culture among the people means that we can't control the budget. The budget pumps excess demand into the system. That fuels inflation. When inflation is high, nominal interest rates are high. When the inflation differential between ourselves and our competitors and trading partners is high, the exchange rate comes under pressure. Also, the excess demand from the budget leaks into imports. That puts further pressure on our, our exchange rate. So really, we have to break that non-virtuous cycle and uh, sort the budget deficit out. So let me, um, uh, you know, if one is to summarize what's happening right now, um, the government, uh, in my view, has taken some very important steps. It has committed itself to a stabilization program and the heart of that stabilization program is fiscal consolidation to bring the budget deficit down to 3.5% of GDP. Now that is crucial. Um, that has to happen. Without that, it's unlikely the other things will happen. 
and at the same time, the um, I've talked about all these area development programs, and there are a number of other things like the uh, Kandy Colombo Highway, the Ratnapura Colombo Highway. A lot of development is ready um, um, in the pipeline. However, those things are going to take a couple of years, two, three years, to really come on stream. And what has to happen in the next 12, 24 months is that the animal spirits of those of you in this room, the domestic private sector needs to get activated. The domestic private sector needs to take a call. Is the government serious about its fiscal consolidation and stabilizing the economy? The minister also in his, uh, I know, is doing a lot of work in terms of improving the investment climate. Um, there's on the doing business index, on trade facilitation, they're putting in a new trade policy. Uh, so you take all that together, you can take your own call, you can study all this uh, for yourself, but the case I would like to make is, as long as the fiscal consolidation takes place, if the government is committed to that, that is the real acid test, that's the litmus test. If the government is serious about that, there are lots of other things going on as well. And if you bring all of that together, in my view, that's, this is a good time to think in terms of um, committing oneself to uh, the Sri Lankan economy and investing, create jobs uh, and create growth. I promise I'd answer the questions that uh, Man uh, Manju had had uh, posed to me, I think I have about five minutes, and the question was, how, Sri, how can Sri Lanka expand its global footprint with the exposure to international capital markets while overcoming challenges in fluctuating economic conditions? Let me just quickly say, in terms of expanding the global footprint, clearly the export narrative comes into play. We've got to diversify our export products, we have to diversify our export destinations. I mean, that is a you know, clearly a must if we're serious about accelerating our development process. Uh, and in terms of export products, we need greater complexity in our export products if we are to create decent jobs that our people want. In 1980, Sri Lanka and Thailand had similar exports. If you map the exports of the two countries, they looked very similar. If you map it today, it's quite dramatic what Thailand has achieved in terms of the automotive, uh, industry in terms of the agri, agri uh, agro industries, it's it's a, a massive difference. So we need uh, we need to expand our foot global footprint through uh, destinations uh, for our exports with kind of complex uh, more complex products as well. Um, and clearly, we shouldn't forget our traditional markets either. We need to consolidate and build on those as well. Uh, another way, of course, of, uh, of increasing our global footprint is for our companies to go out and invest. Uh, now, there's a bit of a trade-off. If you invest more abroad, it means perhaps you're diverting resources from investment here. Uh, but I think there's a happy balance that can be struck. Uh, and so I'm, I'm sure some countries, uh, some companies as they are, will continue to invest abroad to, uh, 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 to increase to help increase Sri Lanka's uh, uh, footprint abroad. Now, in terms of the country's exposure to international capital markets, um, clearly in the last uh, five, you know, more than that, yeah, about six years, I think the first, no, more than that, the first sovereign bond was issued in 2007, um, international sovereign bond. So we have now got a very heavy exposure to international capital markets and rating agencies. Um, next year is not so bad because there is no sovereign bond that's coming up for repayment. But every year after that, there is a sovereign bond which was taken earlier, which would need to be repaid, which we need to roll over. It's about a billion dollars each time. So it's critical that we have maintain our ratings, improve our ratings, because as you know, downgraded, we need to improve our ratings, and for that, what everybody is looking at is the fiscal story. So again, it comes down to the fiscal consolidation. So if we can sort out the fiscal side and do the stabilization, I think we'll have a decent chance in terms of improving our rating. And I think as these other development projects kick in and our exports increase, 
we will be in a better position to recycle, uh, to rather uh, roll over our debts uh, and get ourselves into a better position. Next question, what, be, what will be Sri Lanka as the CBSL, the central bank's key area of focus and strategies in place to create values for its shareholders over the short and medium term? Maybe I should make this the last question. Now, the Monetary Law Act sets out two objectives for the central bank. That's price and economic stability and financial system stability. On the former, that's price and economic stability, the central bank has two instruments and that are available to it. That's monetary policy and exchange rate policy. Now, the ultimate objective in the medium term um, is to deliver low and stable interest rates and a competitive and stable exchange rate. Now, by listening to me, you will think that uh, I have a major fetish on the fiscal problem. Um, now, now, I have actually a very personal interest in the fiscal situation being resolved because the job of the central bank and naturally the governor of the central bank becomes a lot easier if the fiscal situation is stable because if the fiscal outcome is 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 non uh, non destabilizing you can deliver very easily low nominal interest rates and a stable and competitive exchange rate. Because you're not having to grapple with the excess demand that's been pumped into the system by the budget. So when central bank governors get exercised by the fiscal deficit, you know why? Because it makes their life a heck of a lot more difficult if you have uh, the fiscal uh, situation out of control. So in the medium term, as I said, as the government's fiscal consolidation kicks in, uh, hopefully, uh, the central bank will be able to deliver uh, low and stable nominal interest rates and a competitive and stable exchange rate. But in the short run, you know, in for a number of years now, we've had what one would call fiscal forbearance or fiscal dominance. Monetary policy has been subservient and exchanges policy subservient to fiscal uh, indiscipline. There has been fiscal indiscipline and monetary policy has not lent in against it. So you need fiscal monetary coordination. If fiscal policy is out of kilter, monetary policy has to be tightened. And to, to really counteract the excess demand that's been created. But that is not what has happened. Monetary policy, we've kind of uh, had far too accommodating a monetary policy. And the exchange rate has also been held because they say, okay, you have to service this debt, so you have to hold the exchange rate. But all that happens is that at sooner or later, the crunch comes and you have interest rates going up by four, 500 basis points, the exchange rate depreciating by 10, 15%. Now, as a central bank, we would like very much to avoid that, um, avoid that situation. We want to be forward looking. This is why we raised interest rates 50 basis points, because we had some concerns on the fiscal side because of the issues about VAT. Also, inflation was at the higher uh, end of our, um, at the top end of our, infl in the inflation band we are working within. Uh, and then the private sector credit was growing uh, too fast, and our monetary aggregates were above our target. So all that was there too. But part of it was to lean in to the possible slippage on the fiscal side because of the difficulties that are there with the VAT. So that is how we would like to conduct our monetary policy, to look forward, be forward looking, and to not to tolerate, to have the kind of fiscal forbearance we've had in the past. I hope we'll be able to do that. Um, so as I said, I'll make that my last question. There are a couple of others, but my time is out. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, again Manjula and his team for inviting me. Uh, um, and I think we are all grateful to the Honourable Minister for taking time to come. Uh, you know, the, the Honourable Minister has a habit of, of putting me into interesting places, <laughs> Inclu including the job I have now. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so um, I'm not sure whether I should thank him or not, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with him and all of you. Thank you all very much.